Hi, Bob. Hi, Brian. Welcome, uh, welcome to Blogging Heads. Well, I'm, I think I'm happy to be here. We'll see. <laughs> well, I, I'm happy to have you here. This is our. This is a, sort of an experiment because the the the, the you know high tone discussion on this site is usually devoted to um, you know uh, the Iraq War and immigration and and the national economy. But today, you and I are going to attempt to do one of these things on sports. Well, no, don't, let's not devalue our discussion. I'm no, not no, so no. sure. I'm not so sure that all of it doesn't start in some sense right here. I think the uh, perverted values that kids learn in youth sports uh, really go right on to uh, to Congress and Enron, and, and there's a clear line between the field house and the White House. I've always thought <laughs> that's a very that's a very good phrase. Okay, we won't we will not limit it, but we will say that we are gear we are starting anyway with sports and and, and moving on into the broader world from there. How's that? Okay. Um, some introductions. Uh, you are Robert Lipsight. You're a former columnist, sports columnist at the New York Times, the author of numerous books, including uh, Sports World, which is one of my favorites, and most recently Raiders Knights. Raiders Knight or Raiders Knights? Raiders Knight. Raiders Knight. It's a young, it's a young adult novel about the dark side of high school football. Excellent. And uh, I'm Brian Curtis. And I'm a contributing writer to Play, which is the uh, New York Times sports magazine. So the first thing, Bob, I want to ask you about today is baseball and steroids, since it's that time of year. I think that's a marriage made in heaven. Uh, (laughs) I never understood how you could go up the Pyrenees without hard drugs. And I also (laughs) don't think it's possible uh, to go up against a fastball or throw one consistently without hard drugs. I'm all for it. You're, you're, you're all for the combination. Absolutely. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think the genie has been out of the bottle for so long that anything... Uh, well, I, actually, I, I think that what bothers me is that this discussion seems to be an ethical discussion rather than a scientific discussion. I think what we don't know is um, what this stuff does. For how long does it do it? And what are the long-term effects? There has not been really good hard science. And I think that part of the reason is that baseball itself, and, and, and when I say baseball itself, I, I can't talk for anybody except a, a good friend who happens to be an owner, not in New York. Um, <laughs> and, and I really kind of have gleaned that it's a don't ask, don't tell attitude. Uh, they're very happy because baseball has been very, very good to them in recent years. Sure. And their only real concern is uh, about recreational drugs, that the guys will you know, go back into 70s mode and start using cocaine and things that would affect performance negatively. They don't care. I don't care. Fans don't care. Some uh-huh. sports writers care because they don't have much to write about. My only concern, and I'm about to end my rant, is that um, no, is that kids whose you know, bones are still coming together, who are neurologically still in the process of becoming, are taking stuff that can do long-term damage. But, you know, when we're talking about some narcissistic 35-year-old guy desperate to stay in the show, it's, it's his body. Mm-hmm. And is it, I mean... I completely agree with you in terms of the science being an incredibly murky. We're, you know, we're in this, we're in this, we're in this period. I mean, if you read, if if you read, God bless you, if you did the Mitchell report, mm-hmm. the scientific aspects of it were very, very shaky. You know, I mean, you know, hu- you, we talk, we're talking about steroids on the one hand and also human growth hormone right. uh, on the other. And there is no, and, and don't forget the fact that. Uh, these are very rich guys who can afford really good doctors and chemists. So <laughs> right, I, I think right. that I think we're beyond HGH into boutique drugs uh, that have been really carefully created uh, for specific needs. Look, right now um, they are busting high school kids all over the country uh, yes. for with their chemistry sets in their parents' basement, cutting uh, powdered drugs from China into liquid steroids for injection. So if, if these non-Westinghouse winners in high school are doing it uh, all over the country, uh, can you imagine 
what a good, smart scientist is doing for an athlete. Probably without even thinking that what he's doing is criminal. Mm hmm. And do you, I mean, four months after the Mitchell Report, did that in your mind accomplish anything at all? Yes. I thought the Mitchell Report was a brilliant piece of spin. Uh, <laughs> what it did was create the idea that we are now in the post steroids era. I, they didn't mean HGH, but that we have now done this thing, we've named these, what were these, these 89 fringe ball players or people who were not active anymore, most of them, uh, and now we can move on into a, a juice-free future. Right. So, right. So, in a, so essentially the document allowed baseball to sort of seemingly yeah. wash his hands of the whole thing. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think it was a, a very clever move, and it, it kind of... Um, forestalled anything else of a substantive nature. In terms of, I mean, but surely the sports writers, the ones who were so hard after these guys are, are going to be hard after these guys in the future, right? In terms of finding out whether they're... Whether well, they're whatever. yeah, I mean, um, sports writers, I, I almost feel sorry for the hacks. Um, How so? Here, well... Uh, if, if you want to you know, look for real complicity, uh, it was the mainstream sports writers. Uh, it's not as if they didn't know. I mean, first of all, if they were, you know, as they tend to uh, front themselves, you know, insiders, locker room guys, good sources, they, they had to know that a lot of guys were using drugs. Sure. Even if they didn't, um, once... Once some of the early stories in 96, 97, 98 were out, uh, general managers were talking about it. Uh, uh, the, the Andro was seen in McGuire's locker. Remember, you know, right. when, when that uh, AP guy saw the Andro in McGuire's locker, it should have caused kind of a steroid feeding frenzy. You know, all these great investigators should have moved in and gotten the story. But no, they called him a snoop for looking in <laughs> McGuire's locker. They yeah. wanted this glorious summer of SWAT. They wanted baseball, our game that we write about, to bind the wounds of a country damaged by uh, Clinton and Lewinsky, uh, right. that other famous battery. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they, they never they never went on. I mean, you, you've got these these uh, sports writers now, you know, beating their chests. Righteous. I mean, I think I, I read Mike Lupica, who, who tends to, uh, other than pimping for Imus, he tends to be harmless. But you know, his kind of righteousness about all this doesn't really reflect well against the elegiac uh, columns and book he wrote in '98. About I was going to say, he had, a, he, he had a book contract hinging on, on the summer of 98 going right. right. to right. so, the script. I mean, right. uh, I don't think he was writing about the summer of steroids. I mean, and that, that is part of the problem when we talk about the pre when we talk about sports media, right, if we can generalize here, is that there is this adherence to the, you know, in 98, the adherence was to the storyline that baseball was back that, you know, we had entered this, you know, after the strike in 94, baseball had sort of finally climbed back into this, you know, sort of esteemed position in, in American life, and they were sort of sticking to that story whether whether or not it was actually true, and however or not, you know, baseball had managed to climb back there, and now that, you know, we're in the sort of Mitchell Report era, mm -hmm. they stick to that, as you say, whether or not, you know, whatever, whatever well, actually you know, true there is. Baseball writers, and maybe sports writers in general, uh, tend to be lovers, uh, they tend to be besotted with the subject. Um, they are very often in denial uh, about the dark side of it. Uh, and right. also it's, it, it's to their advantage as careerists uh, not to lose access and to paint the rosy picture that the fans uh, want to read. I, I have this, this terrible image uh, at your paper. I have this terrible image of Murray Chass, the great baseball writer of, of the Times, on one side, not seeing steroids, and next to him, Judith Miller, uh, seeing the weapons of mass destruction. Oh, my and goodness. Both of them, you know, with this, this marvelous tunnel vision, you know, moving on uh, and leading us into very false premises. 
Uh, I, I think sports writers have, uh, you know, tended to do us a great disservice uh, in not deciding who and what they are. Um, are they there to extend the joy of the entertainment? Fine, you know, be like a, be like a food writer or a um, gossip writer. Uh, are they investigative reporters? Well, there are a few of them that are and have done well. Uh, then, you know, then dig out the information. Uh, are they just, you know, bloviators kind of telling us we don't need them anymore because we've got the internet for that? I mean, this is and this is essentially the the paradox or or whatever you want to or the tension in sports writing since the very beginning, right? Are you no, essentially providing so. free adver- uh, Isn't it? Isn't well? Isn't from the early days? Are you providing free advertising for the you know the the the, the event, or are you treating it like a legitimate feat? I mean, surely in the isn't surely. I, I don't. Other? I I don't think that that really became a conscious concept uh, until the sixties. Okay, uh, agree, I think, agree there, but yeah, I, I think that you know, for most of most of the the previous century, um, there was a real community of interest in every way. I mean, sports writers traveled with the teams. The disparity in income wasn't that great. You know, they were mostly the same color and sex. Um, they, right. they were the kind of the same guys. One. One had better motor skills than the other, and one may have been able to write better than the other. Uh, <laughs> one but uh, things, cases, yeah. things really split in the 60s. And, and you know, part of it was the, the beginning of professionalization of sports writing. And, and sports writers, you know, beginning, we began to think that we were really journalists. What a mistake. Um, and I think that that lasted only so long. Uh, and now it's this kind of, as, as you talk about it, there's this, this very difficult paradox. Sometimes the conflict operates in the same guy, in the same day, in the same story of how mm-hmm. to handle this fact of uh, you know, looking down at a game and wanting to describe it, wanting to extend the fans' pleasure in it, but also kind of knowing what's really going on. Right. And, and, it, and it's, you know, I'm, I don't spend... I don't spend much time in, in locker rooms, thank goodness, these days. But it would seem to me that it's just it's just harder to get it's harder for them, you know, for the sports writer to 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 have any time with the athlete, you know, maybe in comparison to when you, you know, were writing in your first stint with the Times, to just spend any time with the athlete anyway. You know, I mean, you know, the I, guys I, are the guys are protected by legions of publicists and Yeah, and I, I remember the, the second or third Super Bowl I went to, which was uh, the Jets Colts, 69. And the big problem in getting access to Joe Namath on a daily basis was that there were so many kids and little old ladies who were also crowding around him at the hotel pool. Um, (laughs) This sounds bizarre now. How many layers would you have to go through to talk to a quarterback? (laughs) So let me ask you another question that, that sort of, that sort of deals with sports writing in a sense, and, and also with baseball and steroids. When, wh- one of the things that's been pointed out is a potential sort of discrepancy between the coverage of two guys. One of them is Roger Clemens, who is you know one of the greatest, statistically speaking, one of the greatest pitchers in baseball history, uh, played most recently with the Yankees. The other guy is uh, Barry Bonds, who last season broke Hank Aaron's uh, a home run record, longstanding uh, home run record. Um, Clemens was until the until the Mitchell report and the sort of more recent revelations portrayed by sports writers as a guy who, you know, sort of was a great pitcher well into old age because he worked so hard. Whereas you know Bonds and 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 if there was any wonderings about how, if and, if and when he used performance enhancing drugs, those were pretty buried. Uh, with Bonds, it was sort of the opposite. You read you know in the paper pretty frequently about you know Barry Bonds's hat size expanding and and you know all kind you know his body changing and all these kinds of things did you did you sort of did you sort of perceive a disparity in the coverage of those two yeah and i think although race did figure i i think you know i wouldn't totally discount that uh, as some people have uh, i think it was only part of the picture uh there are a couple of other things first of all uh the media was not afraid 
of Barry Bonds. You know, um, San Francisco, kind of a jerk. He can't hurt you. They were afraid mm-hmm. of Clemens, not only, you know, his intimidating presence, you know, but he really seemed tied in to the baseball uh, jockocracy. And, uh, you know, you could lose access for roughing him up. Also, um, we mm-hmm. had been anesthetized to this whole issue by Bonds uh, by the time we got to uh, Roger. And then there was something else. Nobody liked Barry Bonds. I will not bore you with mine, but every sports writer who's ever been in a, in a locker room has a story of being treated badly by Barry Bonds. But now I want to hear your story. Please do. Please tell. Can you share it? Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, it's totally banal. I was, I was uh, doing a piece, the most benign, silly piece, you, not silly, but the most benign piece you can imagine about the San Francisco Giants campaign as a team for pediatric AIDS. This was the mm-hmm. first team, this was the first team that ever did anything around AIDS at all. It was a very big deal. Uh, right. And most of it, most of it was pediatric age because they, you know, most of the players didn't want to take that next step. But it was really a, a, a very, you know, uh, admirable age campaign. And, and they kind of like lined up to give me quotes. Dusty Baker, the whole team. The only one who didn't was, of course, Barry. And I really kind of wanted him. I kind of needed him. And I kept sure. going to him, you know, later. Can't talk to you now. Turned his back. And this went on for a couple of hours until, you know, my time was kind of coming to an end. And finally, I went to his dad, Bobby Bonds, whom I had known from the Yankees. And I said, listen, I'm I'm on a deadline. Uh, Can can you help me out? Um, I I really need to talk to him. And he looked at me and he said, you know, all kindness. He said, I'm sorry, I, I can't help you out. He's... Always been a jerk, and it gives me a hard time too. <laughs> so, but um, so very good. Bobby Bonds couldn't even get a quote from I, Barry. Bonds. I was writing a column. I didn't have to go back. You know, there was there was no real pressure ultimately. Uh, but you can see that if he was really kind of part of your story, if you were covering the Giants or the National League or whatever, sure. um, you could really not like him in a major way. And it would be hard to really empathize with what he went through. Here is arguably the best player of his time. You may be a Ken Griffey fan, but arguably the best player of his time. I agree. Sudden, you know, pre, pre-chemicals, uh, suddenly looking around, and here are these two, you know, uh, bloated meatballs a McGuire and Sosa, who really can't carry his bat, mm-hmm. uh, getting all the attention, all the love and admiration that he so desperately wants. Here is this black prince of baseball, right? You know, son of an all-star, godson of a god, Willie Mays, uh, right. the heir apparent to, uh, you know, the love of the national pastime. And he's, you know, being dismissed you know, by these clowns, white clown, tan clown, uh, you know, jolly boys, uh, who are not really such jolly boys. And uh, you can see that he wanted a piece of that too. And he went and did uh, what any ambitious athlete will do in this time. Uh, he will get a little help. Right. Alleg- allegedly, we should we should say, until... Until, uh, uh, until allegedly, the, until the, allegedly, he went and got a little help. Allegedly, went until the until the conclusion of court uh, yeah. of court proceedings. Um, let me let me turn let me turn toward a another topic here, which has been a particular interest to me lately, which is um, the the NFL. We're recording this a couple of days before the NFL draft, but I guess what what's interested me about the NFL is I, the big story in that league in the last couple of years has been discipline, quote unquote. And this sort of idea that the commissioner Roger Goodell is going to be laying down the law to to ball players who you know sort of commit you know sort of charged with a crime or commit a crime uh, off the field. I mean, 
One of the, I mean, there's, some, there's a couple interesting things to talk about. One is that I think you once described the NFL as being run by middle managers, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Goodell strikes me as the ultimate middle manager now who's now but running. Smart. Who's now, but smart. But smart, right? Yeah. I mean, do, you, do you actually think, I mean, I sort of think what you said about steroids when you say that the, it doesn't decrease the public's interest in the game. Does the idea that, you know, your running back might have been involved in some altercation in the offseason decrease anyone's you know, enjoyment of the NFL? No, is that in, in fact, fact what fact, drives depend- Goodell to do? No, in fact, depending on the uh, the felony, uh, it could increase your interest. I mean, now, Michael Vick and dogs, you know, forget mm-hmm. about it. That's you know, We love dogs. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we care about that. But had Michael Vick, you know, beat up his girlfriend... Well, he'd, be, he'd most likely be playing right now. Hey, you know, strong men have strong appetites, and in, in a way, you know, and, and, and now let's get into conspiracy theory. In a way, I think that uh, this crackdown, uh, or crackdown, or perceived crackdown on off-field uh, misbehavior, is a kind of Mitchell Report smokescreen, also about mm. steroids. I think, I think the National Football League is one big vat of steaming chemicals. I think it's <laughs> impossible to have these incredibly talented, incredibly fast, skilled, you know, 900-pound gorillas moving the way they do you know, without some serious drugs. Um, it's... I, I can't tell you how shameful I feel telling you this, but in the late 60s and early 70s, I remember going into pro football locker rooms and noticing these splashes of acne across the back and shoulders, particularly uh, linemen, back uh-huh. as it was called. And I would look at it and I would say, hmm, I guess the new uh, equipment really chafes. <laughs> uh, boy, what right. a naive dummy I was. Uh, I mean, that was the beginning you know, of, of use. Uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of use there. I think it's totally out of control. Uh, I think that it's very sophisticated drug usage, which may not be showing up at all. And I think that it's very important for this image of control that the NFL posture about how tough it is uh, mm-hmm. on these guys who act badly. This also, also subliminally gives the fan the idea that they're also uh, cracking down on drug use as well. That's really, I mean, that's, 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 that's sort of an interesting point. I mean, I certainly, I certainly agree the NFL is, is ultimately all about control, right, and controlling it. It's very, been very good at controlling its image. I mean, if we, if we stipulate for the moment that you know, players in the NFL, possibly numerous players in the NFL, are doing are using some kind of illegal drugs, and I think only someone living in a fairy tale world would probably think that no one in the NFL is, is doing such a thing. How, it, it just doesn't show up, and you, you're you're saying it's so sophisticated that it just doesn't show up. Yeah, I think it's, it's sophisticated, or there may be mechanisms by which uh, they get enough notice. Look, the, the the point is that I don't think that any other sport uses drugs. Uh, as much as the NFL does. Uh, first of all, I, I, think, I think we all understand, we talk to athletes enough, for them to realize that, that nobody is really thinking that, um, that they're deciding to make an unethical decision or doing something criminal. Nobody really thinks there's anything wrong in taking steroids. No athlete mm-hmm. thinks that it's wrong. They see it as a kind of medicine. Uh, it enables right. them, I mean, you know, um, Part and parcel of the other things they're injected I'm a, with. I'm a, I'm a steroid user, Brian. Uh, 17 years ago, after a third cancer operation, my body stopped making testosterone, and I've been having to shoot myself ever since. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I know a lot about uh, steroid use. Um, and I have to tell you that in 17 years of using this stuff, um, my hand-eye coordination has not improved. I still can't hit a curveball, <laughs> uh, and, and also, and also, my fastball has lost, you know, 25 miles an hour. 
So the point is, you you have to be no, a genetic, you're not touching you have to be a, like you used to. Yeah. yeah, you have to be a genetic freak in the first place. You have to be a star or a superstar for this stuff to make you a superstar or a monster. Um, right. Right. So and uh, then these, at the lower level, if you're you know maybe a marginal so these, major, these guys maybe know this. They the also level. come out of a culture where since high school they've been sent in hurt with painkillers. Uh, right. Team doctors have always given them drugs which they didn't necessarily understand. They've done all sorts of things under medical supervision that was not necessarily in their best interests so that they could play. Uh, this, you know, doing it themselves, but very often I suspect with a, a trainer's complicity uh, and kind of the, the owner winking, uh, mm-hmm. is merely an extension you know, of all that cortisone, of all those painkillers, uh, of all those shots that they've taken, and all those concussions, uh, and all the arthritis medication that they will take for the rest of their lives. Let me, um, let me direct you to something that I think is, is also, that's also sort of piques your interest, which is we're, uh, we're sort of in the midst as we record this of college basketball players declaring for the for the uh, NBA draft I should say there's this rule that was enacted in college in college basketball recently that instead of jumping from uh, high school directly into the pros which so many players like Kevin Garnett had been able to do that you now had to go play one year of college basketball or I think at least had to be one year removed from high school in order to be drafted into the pros. And this week we've seen, the last couple weeks we've seen players like Michael Beasley, who's from Kansas State, who played one year there, uh, sort of declaring for the NFL draft. Now, I'm the NBA draft, excuse me. Now, it's a lot of people from just really from the sort of sporting perspective have said this is a great deal because these guys play sort of one year of high school, one year of college basketball, and, you know, and whoever's a fan of the NCAA tournament gets to see them rather than seeing them on some, you know, on some grainy high school video. What What is your take on the, on this system well, I, I think, so far? Well, I think uh, it's a good thing for both the NBA and the NCAA. Uh, the NCAA, you know, gets these stars for at least a year. Uh, the NBA gets uh, children who have just a little more fundamental seasoning. Um, mm-hmm. And it seems to me really interesting that so soon after this rule is enacted, there's a kind of merger between the NCAA and the NBA. It was announced um, uh, at, at the end of the Final Four. Uh, their scheme is to, and the details were totally vague. It was just kind of this outline of, you know, we'll invade and there will be cheered as liberator kind of thing. We don't know how we're going to occupy the country after we get there. But uh, the, the idea was that the NCAA and the NBA would control youth basketball. Youth basketball mm-hmm. is now kind of a chaotic thing, basically controlled in pieces by the AAU, which is a uh, shoe company conceit right. now. Uh, by Street agents by street agents, by high school federations, which can't get it together to create a national tournament. Um, But now suddenly, the really big money, uh, one of the richest and smartest uh, globalized corporations in the world, the NBA, uh, and this consortium, non-profit consortium of uh, college athletic departments, which is the NCAA, are coming together to uh, extend the pipeline downward, uh, probably down to middle school, elementary school. Um, you know, if uh, if you're thinking of conceiving a child, you might uh, you want to register the kid now. <laughs> no time like the present, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, this is this is a reaction to youth basketball. What we used to know as youth basketball becoming such a Commodity, right? I mean, no one, you know, in you know, twenty years ago, you wouldn't have ever thought there was any value, right, in, in you know, in thinking about thirteen, fourteen-year-olds playing basketball, right? But well, now we've had I actually now we've had a dec- you know, decade of eighteen-year-olds. You know, a couple of decades ago, there may have been a great value 
and kids playing basketball. Back at the time that we still tended to believe that uh, sports created character and self-esteem right. and I mean, about collective more play. play. But we weren't thinking not about not a, mon- not a monetary we weren't, we weren't thinking of it as a developmental league. Right. Which is what it's now. I mean, is it is it in some sense that the NBA wants to have the kind of relationship? I mean, one of the things about that the NFL has profited from greatly is this rule that in, to play college, to play the pro football, you have to spend three years at least in college. And the NCAA football effectively becomes a full scale developmental league for the for the NFL, where the players, by the time they get out, are more or less ready to play professional football. You know, they've physically developed a lot since their high school years. They've been in college for a period, so, you know, presumably they've, you know, learned different things there and all those kinds of fundamentals and all that stuff. And and with the NBA, there's been less, fair enough to say until this point, less control because, the you know, the player either comes out of high school or he comes out at some random point, you know, in his college career, right? And they want to sort of institutionalize that relationship a little bit more. Is that fair enough? Well, yeah, but I mean... Um you know, there have been enough Kobe's and LeBron's and lesser players uh, that it works. You don't have to go to college. Right. I agree. Right? Right. You don't have to go to college. I think the games are that much different. I think that uh, the maturation process, the physical maturation process, may be different. Um, one ball player can really totally change a team uh, far mm-hmm. more readily in basketball than in football. Um, so, you know, the system kind of works. I, I think that um, the new rule, you know, which, which is, I guess is fine, I, I, I really have those strong feelings about it, is really to the advantage of both leagues. Because, I mean, it, a lot of kind of immature guys have been getting into the NBA. You know, it, it, it was kind of wine before its time. Uh, right. and, and a year uh, not only will mature their skill sets, but um, maybe will socialize them a little bit more. Uh, I think and, so. I mean, I think and, that's big. Yeah, yeah and uh, also kind of prepare uh, the audience for this kid. I mean, mm-hmm. how exciting... To see, you know, the star of tomorrow or today. I mean, well, that's, you that's, see, a, that's big. You see I mean, him, the you see him in the Final Four, and you know that next year you're going to see him on the Mavericks. I, I mean, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, especially this year's ENCK tournament was, you know, basically, and up until the Final up up to and including the Final Four, was a showcase for guys who are going to be in the NBA next year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, Derek Rose from Memphis and, and Kevin Love from, from UCLA and then, guys like Michael Beasley in the earlier rounds. And even if it's only one year in college, it already creates this sentimentalized feeling, you know, while Mm -hmm. they're, you know, while they're struggling in the NBA. Oh, we knew them when they were just kids. (laughs) Right, right. The sort of ownership and and college boys. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Fighting fighting for, you know, old U state. <laughs> um, it is. It is. It is amazing what only one year of you know wearing a sort of college logo will do for a player's image. You know, I mean, right. you know, like you said, he's boy. He, he fought. He he really battled bravely for old alma mater. So he must be. Uh, he must be okay. Um, the uh, last thing I want to touch with you on is, is um, the Olympics. You know, it's that. It's that. So that you know, four years again, only a couple months away, and um, I guess the big news in the papers recently has been. In this this um, this hilarious ritual of carrying the torch around the world uh, in advance of the Olympics, the torch has been uh, I don't say attacked, but they've attempted people are attempting to wrest the torch away from the uh, the guys running down the streets in London and San Francisco and those things. Yeah, have you been and, following and this? Take it to take it to Tibet. <laughs> right. I, you know, right. I I only think about the Olympics every four years. What about you? Uh, they're correct. Yes, I, I I try I try not to. Sometimes I try not to even think about it. Then, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you were uh, you, were you at the '68 Olympics? I was, and uh, I blew that story. I must tell you. Um, I mean, that's interesting. Forty years ago this year, the, right? Yeah, the day before uh, the Olympics began, a uh, 
a Mexican tour guide on her day off took me to the plaza uh, where the students had been machine gunned as part of the Olympic cleanup and showed me the brownish stains on the cobblestones. And, um, you know, I had no reason to disbelieve her. But I was a you know very proper New York Times reporter, and it hadn't been in the New York Times, you know, or mm-hmm. on the AP wire, or on any kind of mainstream thing. So it was hard for me to to understand uh, that even such a thing could happen, even you know even in Mexico, even uh, with a country trying so desperately to provide uh, a tourist face to the world. Uh, but then you know. Then you go back, and it goes back even further than the Nazi Olympics. You know, the, the guy who, who kind of restarted the Olympics, this, you know, saintly Baron uh, Kubrickan, um, yeah, he, 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 he rebooted it uh, because uh, they had lost the Franco-Prussian War, and he mm-hmm. wanted to get French kids in shape. Right. Uh, and I, I think early on he wanted to keep Germans and women out. Uh, but um, so I mean it's always been intensely politicized right um, and either the country was using it as a showcase its enemies were trying to discredit it other countries were trying to come in and get on the scoreboard or in the most grotesque uh, happening a terrorist organization trying to you know without a team set a team of terrorists to right. put themselves in 72 on the scoreboard. So, I mean, it's it's hard to see the Olympics uh, from a distance in, in any way, but that way, on the other hand, and, and of course now now the athletes are, are making a lot of money from the Olympics. There are all these you know, $50,000 you know, from the Federation for a gold medal. Sure. But, um, you know, these people really try and work very hard for that one shot. So, um, you know, I, I have, you know, really mixed feelings about any kind of boycotting or protest or disruption. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great spectacle. I think it's a, it's a wonderful show. And I think if we can kind of, you know, keep it uh, in, in that box and not think of it as any kind of national virtue for us or yeah. them, uh, you know, we can... We can find some sport that we enjoy and follow it. Uh, otherwise, it's you know it's it, it's really been so devalued. I think over the years, with so many other spectacular sports emerging, while it has lost whatever you know um, you know patina that it has had of internationalism and fellowship, that the Olympics is just another. It's another big NASCAR race to me, and I love NASCAR. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, you know, and some of it just feels. I mean, I, I personally boycott the opening ceremonies just because I can't stand to watch them anymore. You know, the sort of hours and parades of nations while you know a couple of uh, NBC announcers make you know jokes and light banter through the whole thing. Um, to take the just to finish up to take the '68 Olympics one more time with John Carlos and and Tommy Smythe. You know, I was thinking about athletes and political activism recently. Is there, to your mind, when we when we say that athletes are there is it's very it's very rare to see an athlete who makes you know who goes very far to make any kind of political statement these days. Is that just the obvious reasons? You know, they don't want to you know disrupt their Nike shoe contract or something like that. I mean, is it are there are there other factors there that you know beyond what you would sort of think? I, I think there are a lot of factors. Brian, and uh, although not wanting to disrupt your Nike shoe uh, contract seems totally justified to me. Um, <laughs> right, right. It's a lot of it's a lot I, of. Money. I think so. that you know there was an enormous amount of ferment in the culture in 1968. Uh, athletes, athletes tend to come to these things a little later. You know, they've been channeled, they've been controlled. Uh, mm-hmm. Athletes. I think athletes are at least as smart as everybody else. Most of them, I think, are smarter than everyday people, but they're, they're, they tend to be ignorant uh, because they have been so uh, channeled and so focused and directed since they're you know, since you're 10 years old and haven't even had to take out the garbage 
you know, much less think about current events uh, and, and, and perform for your, your family, your community, your team, and the enormous responsibilities that, that go with it. Um, sure. So, I mean, first of all, unless there's an enormous surge of activism uh, in their community, college, high school, you know, wherever they are, it, it's certainly not going to happen on its own. Now, in 68, there was. Uh, right. And uh, Carlos and Smith came out of real activism. Harry Edwards, their sociology professor at San Jose State, was the architect mm-hmm. of that Olympic boycott. Jack Scott, uh, you know, Kareem Abdul Dabar did not then did not go to those Olympics in his protest. So there was a lot of you know serious uh, protest involved with that and with the stripping of Muhammad Ali's title. Now, what happened was the establishment crushed everybody. You know, Smith and Carlos did not reemerge for years. And I was thinking, I had been very close to the, the protest movement in 67, 68, and I was kind of faintly disappointed at the Black Power Salute. It was actually the mildest display of that year. You know, mm. they... Um, You're saying paling in comparison to what you've seen outside of the... Absolutely, and, and even paling in comparison to what the plans had been. They were going to take their shoes off. Of course, the whole the whole Adidas Puma thing was starting to happen then, and so nobody right. was going to mess with shoes too much. But um, So Smith and Carlos were wiped out. Ali's best, three best fighting years were wiped away. He never really recovered in a corporate way. Uh, it became very clear that any athlete who protested, you know, would be shut down. Right. And they, and they were. And so all that energy, you know, all that um, sense of self went into, you know, personal promotion. And I, you know, the, the line ultimately became um, Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan, who was criticized for, you know, not being an activist, but... Right. What was he going to? What, you know, what exactly would he, was he going to be an activist about, other than you know, making on his Nike shoe contract? I mean, the greatest piece of activism that we saw was really by Michael Jordan in the '92 Olympics, the Dream Team, when he took the American flag, and this I thought was the ultimate ironic, iconic gesture. He took the American flag on the when he got to the medal ceremony, right. and he wrapped it around himself to cover up the Reebok logo. That's because right. Because he was a yeah. Nike guy. Right. That he was forced to wear. That's right. Right. So, um, <laughs> so that, that, was, that was the end. You know, there's part of me that doesn't really want athletes to uh, become political and to demonstrate one, because most of them are right-wingers. <laughs> And, and two, well, maybe on the be, professional golf tour, yeah. And, and, and two, because most of them really um, don't know that much. As I said, not not because they're stupid, but because they've been really busy. Um, <laughs> and so I, I would rather wait until they were in their thirties and forties when they knew something um, mm-hmm. before they start marching. Right, and and by then the Nike contract will have lapsed, and we can. Right, we can we can they, they, unless, they'll be less they'll be less unless they than the, anyway. Senior shoes, that's that would be the next thing. Keep them quiet. <laughs> well, Bob, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. What great fun! What great fun! And hopefully, we'll we'll meet again and and you know do our own sort of version of sports radio here one more time. Anytime. All right. Take care. <laughs>